Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here today. So um, we've been talking about the um, Mountains and Waters Sutra, what mountains have to tell us, what water has to tell us. And um, <clears throat> There was a, a third metaphor about the stone woman giving birth at night. We discussed that last, last week. Um, so today we'll be discussing a passage uh, that introduces the water. What does water have to say to us? What can we learn from water? So I, th I think we'll um, start by just going to the um, the text here. Water is neither strong nor weak neither wet nor dry, neither moving nor still, neither cold nor hot, neither existent nor non-existent, neither diluted nor enlightened. When water solidifies, it is harder than a diamond. Who can crack it? When water melts, it is gentler than milk. Who can destroy it? Do not doubt that these are the characteristics water manifests. You should reflect on the moment when you see water of the 10 directions as the water of the 10 directions. This is not just studying the moment when humans and heavenly beings see water. This is studying the moment when water sees water because water has practice realization of water. Water speaks of water. This is complete understanding. You should go forward and backward and leap beyond the vital path where other fathoms other. So um, that's a lot to take in. And a little confusing, I'm, I'm going to um, read a couple other translations that just may shed a little light on this passage. Water is neither strong nor weak, neither wet nor dry, neither moving nor still, neither cold nor hot, neither being nor non-being, neither delusion nor enlightenment. Solidified, it is harder than diamond. Who could break it? Melted, it is softer than melted, it is softer than milk. Who could break, who could um who could break it? Uh, this being the case, we cannot doubt the many virtues realized by water. We should then study that occasion when the water of the ten directions is seen in the ten directions. This is not a study only of the time when people or devas see water. This is a study of water seeing water. Water practices and verifies water. Hence, there is a study of water speaking water. We must bring to realization the path on which the self encounters the self. We must move back and forth along and spring off from the vital path on which the other studies and fully comprehends the other. And uh, a third translation goes like this. Water is something 
that is neither strong nor weak, neither wet nor dry, neither active nor quiescent, neither cold nor warm, neither existing nor not existing, neither diluted nor enlightened. When it freezes, it is harder than diamond. Who could break it? When it melts, it is softer than milk. Who could break it? Therefore, at once, it is impossible to wonder at the merits of its actualized existence. You should take some time to study the occasion when you should look carefully in the 10 directions at the water of the 10 directions. This is not just studying at a time when one sees human or heavenly water. It is studying when water sees water because it is water practicing and realizing water. There exists the investigation of water, speaking about water, and you should bring about the actualization of the path on which the self meets the self. You should move forward and backward along the active path on which the other pierces the other, and you should leap clear. So, um, so clearly this is a metaphor and metaphors are chosen because one thing in, in a sense relates or has similar characteristics to another thing. And clearly he's talking about water, but uh, what, what is the other part of the metaphor or what are the other parts of the metaphor? What else is Dogen referring to? Shohaku Okamura, in his excellent commentary on this, says that the other part of the metaphor is Buddha Dharma. That water is being related to Buddha Dharma. But what is Buddha Dharma? We'll get to that in a minute. But <clears throat> first of all, let's, let's Think a minute about water. What is water to us? Well, it's it's huge. So, um, seventy one percent of the Earth's surface is covered by water, and ninety seven percent of that water is in the oceans. So only a small amount is really fresh water. And of that fresh water, only a small amount is really accessible for us to use. Because about 70% of it is in glaciers. It's frozen water near the poles or on mountaintops. And another almost 30% is, is underground, much of which is so deep that we cannot access it. So actually there is only about half of 1% of the water on earth that is accessible and usable for us. fresh water that we can use for the various uses that we place water to. So what is water? Water is, of course, a hydrogen and two hydrogens, one oxygen, um, combined with covalent bonds. It's relatively stable in amount in the earth, although water is being formed from uh, all the time. And it's, uh, it's at times uh, uh, being returned to its elements of hydrogen and oxygen. But the total amount of water is relatively stable. It's ubiquitous, it's all around because it can take so many forms near the ambient temperature on Earth. 
It can be, as, as we know, solid or liquid or gas. Water vapor is lighter than air, so it rises up, evaporates from liquid water on the surface of the earth or on our skin, evaporates and takes some heat away as it evaporates, allowing us to maintain our body temperature to stay cool relatively as we perspire. And the water vapor rises up and then when it reaches a cold place sufficiently high in the sky, it condenses once again and forms clouds. And periodically the clouds release liquid water back to the earth. So water has the characteristics of being all pervasive. It's all around us, beneath us, above us, and in all the 10 directions. And it's also inside of us. So about 60% or so of our body is made up of water. So we're not separate from water. We're very much water. About 75% of our brain considered our, you know, sort of ultimate organ um, is made up of water. So when we think about water, it is in a sense water thinking about water, water seeing water. And water is, um, very essential to us. We um, tend to take it for granted because at least here, it's so accessible. Um, but whereas water is ubiquitous and um, in a way there's plenty of water, it's not distributed evenly. So that at times there's not enough water or there's too much water. So um, with, and recently water has been sort of much on our, our minds with various floods in various places, with droughts. Um, so this is sort of the most recent depiction of what's going on water-wise in the United States. And you can see that there are large parts of the United States that have these dark colors that indicate either uh, exceptional drought or extreme drought or severe drought. Uh, in St. Louis, we're in an area where uh, there is just uh, it's dry conditions, this yellow color. But there are parts of Missouri which are uh, in the exceptional or severe drought areas around Kansas City and southwestern Missouri. And some of those are in areas uh, that have some of the best farmland in the country. So the dryness is a problem for us. Recently, the this year, the Mississippi River and the Missouri River are both at record low levels, historic low levels. The rain this past week helped a bit, but it's still fairly low. And some barge traffic is having trouble getting up and down the river. In fact, they couldn't pass at all in the lower Mississippi earlier. In uh, Baton Rouge, uh, this uh, ship from a century ago was uncovered because the river was so low. 
people didn't know it was there until this year. So water has these characteristics. It's seemingly you know, sort of always there around us, um, but it's also precious. We need it. We desperately need it. Life cannot persist without water. So how about the other part of the metaphor? If we say that the metaphor is about Buddha Dharma, what is Buddha Dharma? Buddha Dharma is a term uh, that is in the Mahayana tradition. And there are other terms that are either exactly equivalent or roughly equivalent, um, Buddha nature, Dharma nature, reality, things as they are, emptiness, essence, the pervading principle, the way, Buddha nature, Buddha Dharma. So in this passage then, Dogen is trying to emphasize how Buddha nature is all pervasive in a way, inescapable. Buddha Dharma is above us, below us, all around us and within us. It's very ordinary, but also precious. Um, Okamura referred to another passage from Dogen that um, succinctly explains what Buddha Dharma is. Dharma nature is simply eating morning gruel, eating noon rice, and drinking tea. So coming back then to the passage from the Mountains and Waters Sutra. Water is neither weak nor strong, nor wet nor dry, etc. It's reminiscent of um, the Heart Sutra that many of you are familiar with. The passage that goes, O Shariputra, all dharmas are marked by emptiness. They neither arise nor cease, are neither defiled nor pure, neither increase nor decrease. They're beyond dichotomies. Beyond the this and that of discriminating mind. but everywhere. And it's when we reflect on Buddha Dharma, when we reflect on water, it's water seeing water. Buddha Dharma seeing Buddha Dharma. We're beyond description because we're within it. We're, we're part of it. We can't separate ourselves from it. There's a, um, a story that I think 
um, complements the passage of Dogen that I read about morning gruel and noon rice. And many of you may be familiar with this. And it comes from uh, the eighth century, the sayings of Layman Tang. One day, Chateau said, I've come to visit you. What have you been doing? The layman said, if you're asking what I do every day, there is nothing to say about it. Chito said, well, what did you think you were doing before I asked you about it? The layman made up a verse on the spot. What I do every day is nothing special. I simply stumble around. What I do is not thought out. Where I go is unplanned. No matter who tries to leave their mark, the hills and dales are unimpressed. Collecting firewood and carrying water are prayers that reach the gods. So part of this passage, I think, is about looking at this distinction we make between the ordinary and the precious. The water is very ordinary, but it's critically necessary. It's very precious. And we realize how precious it is when we don't have it. So this distinction between the ordinary and the precious is something we make up. So how do we find the precious in the ordinary? And how do we find the ordinary in the precious? How do we practice that? I think that's what Dogen is putting before us. So I, I think I'll, I'll stop there with that. And what is precious? What is ordinary? And why do we have this gradation, this distinction? How do we, how are we overlooking the precious in the ordinary? And how are we elevating the precious in the usual sense? and not considering it part of the ordinary. So um, thank you very much for, for listening today. And we'll, uh, we'll break up into groups here shortly.